on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored. It was terrifying to have my brother um, scream and shout at me and my father say things that just simply weren't true and, and my grandmother, you know, quietly sit there and, and sort of take it all in. Winding Prince Harry further torches his royal relations with a blistering attack on the British monarchy and deeply personal incendiary claims about his own family. Buckingham Palace remains dignified in his silence about the Netflix fallout, but senior royals tonight presented a united front at a charity carol service. The big question now is how much damage will this series inflict on the monarchy and Britain's image across the world? Also tonight, tens of thousands of nurses strike in the biggest walkout in the history of the NHS. One of the nurses who saved Boris Johnson's life is now striking, and she's here exclusively to tell me why. Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Today, Harry and Meghan torch what little was left of their relationship with the royal family and what little was left, frankly, of their own reputations. Last week was mostly sycophantic. This latest instalment was downright seditious. Prince Harry mauls his own brother. He accuses his father, the new king, of being a liar. He even has a dig at his late great-grandmother, the Queen, for standing by and doing nothing. The royal family is directly accused of destroying two of its own to protect itself. And I don't know where it all stops, all this. Where does it end? We've got the book, and then we've got the interview circuit, and so it goes on. It's all apparently a dark plot by Britain and the royals to smear the poor, defenceless, vulnerable Sussexes. Trickery, treachery, hypocrisy. And if there's one conclusion to draw from the final instalment of their Netflix series, it's that Prince Harry surely has now a traitor to the country that he once served. William and I both saw what happened in our, in our dad's office and we made an agreement that we would never let that happen to our office. And to see my brother's office copy the very same thing that we promised the two of us would never, ever do, that was heartbreaking. It was terrifying to have my brother um, scream and shout at me and my father say things that just simply weren't true and, and my grandmother, you know, quietly sit there and, and sort of take it all in. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. And yet, for three years, they were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. Unbelievable. This blistering attack, not only on the institution of the monarchy, but also personally against the senior royals who represent our country around the world, is, in my view, beyond contempt. In their selfish, vapid attempts to rewrite history, recasting themselves as victims, these two have sold their souls and they sold Harry's family down the river. It's unforgivable and it will leave a bitter taste in the mouths of millions of people. But there are toe-curling moments in the show too, moments that would upset even the strongest of stomachs. View okay, Viewers are force-fed simpering clips of the pair frolicking on Californian beaches during COVID in Tyler Perry's mansion, no less. While most people were locked down, many in tiny homes with lots of children. But they were the real victims, not the thousands of people dying from a new pandemic virus. They again cry foul, of course, at the beastly, horrible media for pursuing them and wanting to take their pictures, whilst persistently throughout this new instalment, showing their own highly intrusive pictures of their own children. Did they ask permission from those children to invade their privacy for money, which is, of course, the very charge they make against the media? We also learned that Meghan actually thinks she's done Britain a favour. You get on the plane, and it's not the pilot, but whoever is sort of overseeing the crew. And he came, and he knelt next to my seat, and he took his hat off. And I just remember looking at him, he goes, we appreciate everything you did for our country. And it was the first time that I felt like someone saw the sacrifice not for my own country for this country it's not mine sacrifice is that a joke 
a sacrifice. Who was this guy? Who was this cabin steward? Does he exist? Or is he like the last one you met? Do you remember the Lion King premier? We told you what a hero you were. But we couldn't find him, couldn't we? Will we find this cabin steward who apparently knelt and took his hat off in respect for this awesome woman who'd sacrificed so much for our country that she's actually caused so much damage to? I'd like to know that person exists. Or whether it's just one of the cabin crew doing what they normally do, which is they kind of crouch down, don't they, and they take their hat off if they've got one on and ask whether you want chicken or beef. That's normally what happens. We also learned that Harry can't begin to understand why people might prefer Catherine, the Princess of Wales, who, of course, never complains, never explains, and just does her duty. This is how it's covered for her. This is how it's covered for her. If you don't see the difference and understand why it's being reported that way, why, then I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I just can't. I mean, you sound like a blithering lunatic. Don't you, Harry? You, I can't help you. <laughs> really? Well, let me help you. There were a gazillion critical stories about Kate long before your beloved Meghan came along. It had nothing to do with Kate's skin colour and the Meghan criticism had nothing to do with her skin colour. At all. Nothing to do with it. She just started doing things along with you which were rankly hypocritical and in some cases downright unpleasant and you both got called out for it, and you don't like being criticised. You think if anyone criticises you, they're automatically bullies and racists. But they're not. In fact, one of the people who's been accused of bullying is Meghan Markle by several of her PAs at the palace who had to sign NDAs so they couldn't tell the truth. I'm sure that Meghan Markle and Harry, who want the truth to come out, would like those NDAs to be lifted, and maybe they should say so publicly. So we can hear from those PAs, who I know at least one of them was regularly reduced to tears by the bullying from Meghan Markle. And if Meghan doesn't think she did bully, of course she can sue me, because I've said it now. So come and sue me, and let's take it to court. All of this leaves a deeply unpleasant taste in the mouth, doesn't it? And again, I say simply, where does it end? How much damage do they want to cause? They can't be allowed back to any royal events because they'll probably be wired up and taped for the next series of their thrilling life story. So what do they do? What does King Charles do about his own son? Does he cut him off? Does he strip him of his titles? This is his son. It's a Shakespearean tragedy unfurling. And I'm afraid when it comes to help, I think Prince Harry might be beyond it. He's been manipulated... And I think partly it's down to him as well, into believing they're genuine freedom fighters. To see this institutional gaslighting that happens is, is extraordinary. Um, and that's why everything that's happened to us was always going to happen to us. Because if you speak truth to power, that's how they respond. Truth to power? What are you talking about? Your Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, once third in line to the throne. It doesn't get a lot more powerful than you before you decamped for your freedom, before you gave up any royal duty, but wanted to have your royal cake and eat it by keeping your title so you could exploit them and make gazillions of dollars in America to the highest bidder. And what do you do for that money? You trash your family endlessly, and you're going to keep doing it, as does your wife who trashes her own family, most of whom she's disowned. Is this what happiness looks like, Harry? Really? You're happy? Hating your entire family? Your wife hating all hers, apart from her mother? Like many of the claims in the series, none of this stacks up, does it? There were the claims of racism at the palace, but no evidence of who that person was or what they actually said. Apparently, Meghan, she repeated this in this new instalment, was banned by somebody at the palace from seeking help for her suicidal thoughts. Think about that for a moment. Who was that person? Are they still working at the palace? Does that person exist? Did somebody actually say to her, you might be feeling suicidal, but it's bad for the brand, you can't get help? And if they did, where was her husband in all this? Where was Prince Harry? Mr Mental Health? He never stops banging on about it. 
and about the need to get help. And yet when his own wife apparently had suicidal thoughts, he didn't get her help. Does that make any sense? Does that sound even remotely plausible to you? Because it doesn't to me. So that's where we are. Another tissue of self-serving lies, mostly, I suspect. We don't know yet, but most of it looks like the Oprah interview, just another load of unsubstantiated smears designed to portray them as victims. But it doesn't really pass the muster of fact-checking. One minute they're the beloved young couple who inspired a nation, the next that nation is horribly racist, out to throw Meghan to the walls from the very beginning. The attacks on the press were so wicked that she was hated and feared for her life. But also the entire plot against them was because they were simply too popular. So they were hated and despised and too popular. And this was all apparently a heroic fight for family privacy, but we have to learn about that fight in a $100 million reality TV show that flaunts their young family and boasts about their very public social justice campaigns. Harry and Meghan take their audience for fools. They blame everybody but themselves. They present even the most incendiary of claims with no evidence. And sadly, the impact is real. The royal family is getting damaged. The monarchy is getting tarnished. People are believing, including Beyonce, it appeared from this series. They're believing that the royal family are a bunch of callous racists. Well, they're not. I know the royal family, a lot of them well, and they're not callous racists. And they're furious about this, and they're right to be furious. OK, well, let's get into debating this. Um, I feel strongly about it. I make no pretense about it. I, the longer this has gone on, the more the attacks have grown in their ferocity, the more that, that you have the knowledge that the other side can't fight back. That's what I find so reprehensible. And Harry knows that. He knows they won't. They're going to maintain the stiff upper lip and dignity, which used to be what being a royal was all about. Well, I'm joined now by my pack, uh, Paul Burrell, of course, famous royal butler, uh, Katie Nichol, one of the top royal uh, experts, I suppose you are, aren't you? Well, don't um, hurry that. And Paula Rowan Adrian, um, of course, is here as well. <clears throat> so let me start with Paul Burrell. Paul, we've talked a bit about this, haven't we, um, about this fracturing between William and Harry. Harry's now gone on television yes. and called his brother William a bully yeah. that bullied him out of the country and made a number of other allegations, called yeah, his dad well, a liar, he had to go at the Queen and everything. When you watched it, I mean, my jaw was dropping that he was literally taking them yeah. all down one by one. What was your jaw doing? I was... Well, I saw six hours of it and I was very saddened by all of it because I realised that there's no way back now for Harry... He's abandoned his family, he's abandoned his duty, and he's abandoned his country. And he, he's disrespected his grandmother's legacy, which is the Commonwealth of Countries, which she upheld all her, all her, uh, through her, uh, her lifetime. And, you know, you can't say these things about your family and get away with it. And I don't think that he'll ever be welcomed back here again. I think the British public will have something to say about that. And it, it, there are certain things that came out in, in this interview which I totally didn't agree with at all. I mean, he said that he couldn't get to his grandmother. He lived literally a few hundred yards away from her back door at Windsor Castle at Frogmore Cottages. He could have walked up the hill, mm. gone through that door and gone into his grandmother's sitting room at any time and said, Granny, I've got a problem. The Queen's door was always open. It doesn't matter about what the courtiers say. Mm. The Queen would say, I'm your grandmother, Harry. I love you. You can come and talk to me if you have a problem. So, Harry, you're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. I know better than that. And the meeting at Sandringham, yes, you did attend that. And in that meeting, apparently Harry said to his grandmother, I'd like to stay in the royal family and wear my uniforms and have my army contacts and then go back to America and do my commercial um, uh, campaigns. And the Queen quite rightly said, Harry, you can't have one foot in the camp and mm. one foot out because that's not fair to the rest of the royal family who can't do these commercial deals, who, who just do their duty for the country. So you can't have your cake and eat it. And quite rightly, the Queen, the Queen herself said no. Yeah. And so Harry went and back so to America and decided to the And so he had a dig at her in the Netflix the series, family. whilst knowing that yes. she'd recently lost Prince Philip and that she herself was in very ill health and yes. has now died, sadly. You know, the timing of yes. all this, apart from anything else, is so reprehensible. 
Paul around Adrian, look, you've always defended. True, and the mon- but, but Paul, the just mon- hang on one sec. Yes, I, I always I, I, defended Harry. I, yeah, I'll, yes. I'll come back to you, Paul. I'm talking to Paul just quickly about this. Yes. You've always defended them. Surely when you watch that latest stuff today, watching anybody take down their brother, their father, their grandmother on television is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. But I have always said to you, Piers that this is only going to get worse unless we stop and start listening. What you are witnessing are people who believe that they have been treated badly. Whether you believe them or not, whether you want to shout at them or not, whether you want to deny them or not, whether we want, whether you want us to listen to 12 minutes of you telling us how awful they are as human beings. I think beings, they are awful. But that may well be your opinion. Yeah. But and you're here is, to give me yours, right? But, which um, is different. Yeah, and what so is happening is... a one-way is, show. I mean, you're entitled to say whatever you want. Well, well, of course, and so are they. And so are they, Piers. Yes. And that is what they are doing. That is what they feel they have been yeah, they can say what they like. To do. But when they do so what... that's when, what they're doing. Fine, but when they do what they do, we are entitled in this country, when our country is put under attack like this and branded a racist country by these two, with a racist royal family at the head of it, Piers. we are entitled to defend we what know, this country stands for. We know for. about the institute that is the royal family. We've seen what happens when somebody calls out a member of the royal, ha- royal household and says that they are racist. What happens to them? Well, they have to stop working. They have to close down... Who was down- racist? Uh, well, we know that there was the incident with Miss with Lady Hussey. No, forget Lady Hussey. No, we, no, we won't she was forget removed, Lady Hussey. She was removed from Piers, office within we, 24 we hours. We won't forget she her. She was removed the moment she because she was made accountable. Of what Who the was royal racist was in like. the royal household to Meghan and Harry? It could have been Lady Hussey. You she don't was know. there at the time. You don't know, do you? It could have been they Lady Hussey. They said it was a member of the family. It could have been somebody else. They said exactly. a member of the family. And so what we're but dealing with... Instead, we're told it could be any of them. So they're all all smeared. By association. And as I've said, we can keep shouting, but the fact is, they are hurting, and we are witnessing that. They're not and unless, hurting, and they're unless counting we their money. deal with that. They're not hurting. Well, you say they're counting their money. Yeah. I mean, look, you're not criticising Mike Tyndall for being on I'm a Celebrity, are you? Or doing adverts with Amazon or Domino's or whoever it is he's doing adverts with. Mike Tyndall with. Is, is not a you paid know. up member so, of the royal family. So he doesn't what? get anything from the, ro- well, from the taxpayers. Neither do they. Not now. Neither do they. Because now, be a bit, they what they've done. They earn money. No, no, hang on. They've given up royal duty and they've left the country and the family, but what they haven't given up is the royal titles, which now make them all the money. Kelly, I was, well, Kelly. I was just about to say the point of royal titles. They Listen, they are entitled to have their opinion. If they absolutely hate the establishment, they hate... Well, they've left Britain, right? Mm. They've stood down as working royals. I, I think there is a real issue with them holding on to those titles. It's very clear to see from everything that we've seen in Netflix that without that royal calling card, there is nothing. That no one is no one is actually interested in what they have to say about Absolutely. anything else. They, so he's if they always dis- going to sorry, be just Harry, let me finish. He's always if going they, to be if, Harry. if they hate the institution so much, if if, if it's racist and bigoted yeah. and Why alienating and everything else, then do what they actually said. And, I, and this was new because this was one of the new things that did come out of today. They offered to return those titles mm. if their version of a half in half out monarchy didn't work. So they put that offer on the table. Yeah. If they have a shred of dignity left. Put that offer back on the table and follow through. Why would you want to be in a racist institution? So, why would why would a black police officer want to be part of of the police metropolitan police? Why would a black female fire officer want to be a part of the London fire brigade? Why do they want to be in the you royal do family? It, you do they it. Hate because, the royal family, because you hate the royal family. They hate the monarchy. It. You do it but because you on, love. They don't it. love oh, the hang royal on. family. But that's, but but that's hang not on. true. No, hang that's, on. You're talking about his dad. Hang you're talking on. about his brother. Hang on. Of course they I'm love. Talking... They are in pain. They are They're hurting. They're not in pain. This is a family. They're causing pain. They're, They're inflicting pain. Is. Come on. There's more. They're the ones doing all the abusing in public. This is called victim blaming. This is a classic. When you step back and look at what's happening. They're not victims. What you are here hearing and what I'm hearing is an absolute tsunami of denial, denial, denial. Anything that comes out anything that comes out of their mouth. I don't believe a word she says, certainly. So I want to hear you say that absolutely everything that has come out of Harry and Meghan's mouth Mm. is a lie. I think a lot of it is actually. Yeah. No, not a lot. Casey, Piers, not a lot. No, no, I think a lot of Everything. it is. Well, look, only the stuff that we right. can substantiate. So if, there, if there is some, if there is some truth in what they've got to there say, should, we not, there should clip, we not be worried? There was a clip. There was a clip today which I thought completely summed them up. There was Tyler Perry, who for some random reason he'd never met them, decides to give him his mansion. So they're living in this vast mansion during the COVID pandemic, which you think they might feel lucky about, but no, no, they're moaning away about that too. 
And Tyler Perry uh, is talking over footage and saying they've been abused by their status in the royal family. And the footage shows a sneaky paparazzi craning down from a rooftop, taking pictures of them with their child. Only it wasn't a paparazzi. It was a royal photographer who had been accredited and approved by them to take those pictures on an official tour. So it wasn't what it seemed. It was a lie. They're the producers of this series. They know it's a lie, and they put it in there so that people fall for this claptrap, rather like we saw the vast army of paparazzi aiming at them at some event, but it wasn't. It was a Harry Potter premiere. They weren't even there. It was five years before he met Meghan Markle. All of it is smoke and mirrors. And on the really incendiary stuff, no evidence. Who is this person at the palace that said to Meghan Markle, I don't care that you're feeling suicidal, you don't get any help? Why didn't Harry get her the help if she was genuinely suicidal? Who is the racist in the palace? They still won't tell us. These are serious allegations causing serious damage to our royal family and this country's reputation. And it's not good enough that they keep going on television, spray gunning everybody again, and they don't give us the actual facts. I think That's Harry not and Meghan have been incredibly brave. Oh, they are do me taking a favor. on an institution please do me that a wants favor. to take them down. And you they're suggest... They're taking on two institutions that I'm afraid they're, they're trying to take down, and this is, this is a blatant attempt to take down, but they won't succeed, and I think the royal family's dignity and maintaining its silence and that show of togetherness Katie. tonight is actually what people want. Pe people, yeah. I think people are just we switching off. I think they've had enough people of people to believe that the royal family are keeping a dignified silence. We know that that's not true. Well, they're they're not we know to fuel we, these narratives. We, sorry. We know, where was we the evidence? Know that where this was the evidence? A source, in the, no, no, no. Or a source close to. Oh, where do, or, no, where you know was that. the evidence well, in their every allegations? Every time we read in the, uh, the articles in the newspapers, mm. it always references a source, doesn't it? Where was the evidence today? It's always a source. Well, where is this source? But there wasn't any, right, there wasn't any I've to, evidence. I've got to leave it there. Final question just to Paul before we let you go. Paul, you've been around the royal family a very long time. What will the royal family be feeling about yes. all this? They'll be appalled by all of this. Washing dirty laundry in public, it's not their scene. And they will close ranks. They will hold it together with dignity. And you're quite right. That's what we expect them to do. Um, don't attack... Kate and William, because they are our future king and queen. Right. Kate has never put a foot wrong. Don't attack her. She's, she's the jewel in our crown right now, and uh, she deserves our respect and uh, admiration. And had unbelievable criticism early on, actually, which everyone can be yes, to You don't see any of that yes. in the series. All just about negative for Meghan, no. positive for Kate. Total lies. Absolute lies. Anyway, but, thank you. But fasten, Paula. Your, fasten your seatbelts, though. Fasten well, your seatbelts. We've got the book to come, right? We've got 400 pages of, come. of crap to come. Yes. I mean, this <laughs> never stops, right? Thank you, Katie. Good thank to see you. you. Thank you, Paula. Thank Always you. good to hear the other view. Uh, I don't agree with it, but I respect your right to have it. I have a misguided. Well, still to come tonight. And look at the division it causes here as well. They've was, launched a load of divisions. Right. This was <laughs> Meghan Markle made a scapegoat for the Royal Rift, or were the fault lines between Harry and William there already? We'll debate that next. And we're going to have a nurse who helped save Boris Johnson's life and is now striking in protest against the Conservative government. That's exclusive and not becoming that.
Well, welcome back. It's another fiery show because this is the subject that gets people's passions fired up. What's becoming clear is that Meghan Markle's definitely not alone in her delusional victimhood. Harry seems even more bitter and twisted about it all and wants us to think he's an even bigger victim. And his relationship with his brother, William, is now likely torched beyond all repair. Well, where did it all go wrong? According to the Sussex version of events, their truth, which is very rarely the truth, uh, says that Meghan Markle was scapegoated by the palace because she was, get this, too popular, whilst at the same time being so criticised. I think Australia was a real turning point because they were so popular, <laughs> so popular with the public. The internals at the palace were incredibly threatened by that. She's becoming a royal rock star, bigger, I would argue, as a couple than William and Kate. That's probably not a good thing in the long term. It's a dirty game. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. You would just see it play out. It's like a story about someone in the family would pop up for a minute, and they go, we've got to make that go away. But there's real estate on a website homepage. There is real estate there on a newspaper front cover, and something has to be filled in there about someone royal. I've seen little cartoons of me on all fours with her um, holding a dog lead and me wearing the dog collar. How predictable that, you know, the woman is to be blamed for the decision of a couple. In fact, it was my decision. She never asked to leave. I was the one that had to see it for myself, but it's misogyny at its best. All doormats say that kind of thing, don't they? Well, joining me now, the author and historian Tessa Dunlop, journalist and columnist Maureen Callan, who across the pond, a former Conservative minister, who gets a mention in the series, uh, Anne Whitcomb. Welcome to all of you. Maureen Callan, what is the view in America about all this? I'm hearing a worrying number of Americans falling for this claptrap, including, it turns out, Beyonce, who sent this ridiculous text message to Meghan Markle after the Oprah wine a thon you know, saluting her courageous, brilliant stand against the, Well, we've got to hear, I think. Beyonce just texted. <gasps> really nice. Shut up. Just checking in. Just checking in, just casual. I still can't you believe... Gonna, you I still gonna... can't believe she knows who I am. Go and call her. No, it's OK. She said she just wants me to feel safe and protected. She admires and respects my bravery and vulnerability and thinks I was selected to break generational curses that need to be healed. That's well said. Yeah, even the dog is calling bullshit on that. Uh, Maureen, um, what do you think? What do you make of this? What does America make of this? Do most rational Americans see through this? Oh, Piers, yes, please. Again, let me reassure you. Beyonce would be in the uh, minority opinion of these two. I think we are all well and thoroughly exhausted by this endless moaning and whinging and banging on, uh, you know, and the hurling of vague accusations. I mean, all this time later, all of these podcasts and interviews and now this six-parter and a book to come, and we still have no smoking gun. What are they waiting for? Well, there is no smoking gun, is there? Or well, we would have heard it by now. Um, all it well, is is endless, endless rehashing yeah. of the same old wines. They're, they're very, very, very in love with their grievances, their victimhood. It's a very strange psyche they seem to share. You know, you were talking earlier about, you know, is how much Harry may be to blame. But I really think in Meghan, he found someone to really unlock, I think, years of rage and resentment and jealousy because... This is like a tsunami. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And the constant comparisons to his mother, actually, I found, I've got to say, pretty distasteful, because in my estimation, having known them both, both women, no comparison whatsoever is valid between Meghan Markle and Princess Diana. And Diana's fame was stratospherically bigger, as was the attention that was afforded to her. All right, Tessa Dunlop, you've been seething and waiting to get well, stuck just... into me all night. Come on. Well, I mean, you do. You are the tangible proof that this is a dirty grain, Piz. You helped make it By a dirty game. Lives. And you're carrying on spreading the muck all around By like a little kiddie who's done a poo and wants to look at it. Well, Let's on, stick on. it everywhere. Hang, hang on, calm down. 
Actually, it's them that's spreading the muck. They're the only members of the royal family doing any of the talking. They're the ones on all the TV stations and TV series and podcasts and books spray gunning their family, our royal family, our monarchy and my country, Britain, branding us a bunch of callous racists. Oh, come on. They are the ones spreading the dirt. Depuff your patriotic chest. Why? They've made Why it very. I? I'm going to explain to you. They've made it very clear that actually I thought they were very coded and careful when they called out rarely, incidentally, you have to sit through a long three hours to find any specifics on William or Charles. They're very careful to target most of it at the Fourth Estate, particularly the Associated Press, which they had a victory over in the courts. Well, it was settled. And, and then, then, then they won the appeal. Harry, but, claimed, but the, specifically, Harry claimed the Daily Mail was, was actually responsible for his yeah. wife's miscarriage and that without is, providing a shred of evidence that that was true. I fed you that line off air. That was a classic case of a vulnerable man who's fighting a difficult case, feeling like or he's a on vengeful, the outside, putting, or a two, vengeful putting two and man. two together and equaling five. Or a, ven or a vengeful, vindictive man who actually says he hates the press and media attention, but has just invaded the privacy of his family in spectacular yeah. fashion because a, a streaming platform has paid him $100 million. Piers. There's a word for that, and it is hypocrisy. Piers, what he did was call out, and he referred to it as the symbiotic relationship between the press and the royal family. He is well within his rights to do that. And, and we're well in our rights I, to judge The him. reason that I feel keen tonight to hold you to account sure. is that, as we heard in that documentary, you were a big player, a giant mouthpiece for literally stirring, or, if I may, shit-stirring the pot. A bit Ooh, Harry and Meghan yeah. are bigger than Kate and William. Ooh, that's going to destabilise things. Ooh, let's just throw in a match and watch it blow up. That's what you did. Yeah, You're like the kid All with right. his finger in the dike, right. waiting, wiggling till the flood comes. Calm down, Tessa. I'm not calm, Piers. Okay, I'm well, not calm. You don't have to be calm. I'm just saying, if you calm down, I can respond, which is to say that up to the point they got married, I was very supportive of them, including on their wedding day, writing a very, very supportive piece for the Mail on Sunday at Actually, about how brilliant it was to see a biracial wedding finally in the royal family. It was only when their behaviour changed, when they became a serial pair of hypocrites, wanting their royal cake and eating it, preaching about stuff they did the complete opposite with, that I turned against yeah. them. Let's go, let's go down to Anne Whittacombe. Anne, you get mentioned in the series. Were you expecting that? And what was your reaction? Honestly, Piers, it gave me the greatest belly laugh that I've had since Neil Kinnock fell in the sea. I mean, <laughs> it was unbelievable. I, I made a, an adverse comment about Meghan on Celebrity Big Brother. Now, as you know, Celebrity Big Brother, you're completely cut off from the rest of the world. You know, I hardly had the palace on the phone. Uh, and apparently, the fact that I had made this comment, which was my own genuine opinion, uh, is all part of, it's, it's proof of the, the conspiracy uh, that there was uh, to discredit Meghan. Well, let's watch... What I'll tell you what, Anne, I gave let's, my own opinion. Let's watch the clip, actually, to, for the viewers who didn't see it. Let's watch the clip from Celebrity Big Brother. But there's real estate on a website homepage. There is real estate there on a newspaper front cover. And something has to be filled in there about someone royal. What do we all think about Meghan Markle? I love Meghan I think Markle. she's very beautiful. No, I love her. Oh, no. OK, let's take yeah. a vote. I think she's trouble. Why do you think she's trouble, Anne? Background, um, attitude, I, I, I worry. She's older than him. Yeah. She's been married before. Yes. I add it all up and I'm uneasy. There we go. Well, you weren't wrong, were you, Anne Whittacombe? Um, because she was. She's a lot older than Harry, five years older. She's a divorcee. The last husband heard it was all over, I think, when she sent the rings back in the mail. Um, and she comes barreling into the royal family, picks up her handsome prince, and before we know it, drags him back to California to turn him into a money machine, and they disown both their families. That, I would say that is the pers personification of trouble. Well, I, I, absolutely. As I say, 10 out of 10 for prophecy uh, on my part. Uh, but I think it's very clear what's gone on. Uh, Meghan wants the lifestyle of an A-list celebrity, but she's never risen above... Um, a part uh, in a, a TV soap opera. Uh, and uh, Harry uh, wants all the trappings of royalty without actually uh, a, the slog of the duty that yeah. goes with it. And that's what they want. Um, and that's what, you know, all this is about. It's about 
making money from the only thing that they've got, which is their royal connection. Yeah. They've got nothing else. They've got nothing else make money to make attacking, their sort of attacking lifestyle Attacking an institution with. that you exploit for personal gain. It's quite breathtaking. Uh, I've got to leave it there. Thank you to my panel. A lively debate. Thank you, Tessa. We'll get you back. Don't worry. You can hold your horses till the next barrage you give me. Uh, well, next tonight, nurses have walked out of the biggest strike of its kind in NHS history. The nurse who helped save Boris Johnson's life is one of them, and she's here exclusively to tell me why. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Piers Morgan on Censor. We clapped, we clanged and we banged for them as they risked their lives for us working on the COVID wards in grossly inadequate PPE. Two years on, for the first time in history, tens of thousands of nurses are on the picket line striking over pay. Royal College of Nursing boss said that she was truly sorry for taking the strike action. Well, joining me now is Jenny McGee, who's the intensive care nurse who looked after and helped save the life of our former Prime Minister Boris Johnson when he was admitted to ICU with COVID-19. Um, Jenny, it's great to see you. Uh, I remember, obviously, what happened, and it was an you know, extraordinary moment for the country as we all sort of waited, and you were part of the team which helped save him, and thank you for that. It was a, a great service you did to the country. Um, now you're going on strike, in a way a protest against the Conservative government, who's leader at the time you helped save his life. Why are you going on strike? What does it mean so much to you that you feel you have to do this? I think um, there's just a real concern for what's happening in our profession. 
Um, we are terribly, terribly understaffed. We have 50,000 vacancies across this country and we are seeing that on the wards. We are seeing that when we're working. We do not have enough nurses on our wards. Um, we feel that nurses are leaving the profession in droves because... And why are they leaving, do you think? I think they're leaving because we've had enough. We have so much pressure and responsibilities put on our shoulders. Um, we are busy every single shift. We can't give that care that we so desperately want to give. And we, are, we feel that we're underpaid. We, as I say, we have a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. We care very deeply about the patients that we look after. And we, but we just want to be paid a fair wage. I completely agree with you, and I would always support nurses up and down the country. I think you're a fantastic group of people. And I think there's a horrible hypocrisy for those who are out applauding you every Thursday as you were literally risking your lives uh, and then now would oppose your right to a fair pay rise. I think that's ridiculous. The question is, I guess, how much in the end would constitute a fair rise? I don't think 19% pay rise for any people in the country right now are sustainable. Uh, and it sets a precedent for the other industries, obviously, as well. What do you think? I mean, inflation's running about 10% right now. What do you think would be a fair, reasonable final settlement? I think personally, from my point of view, I think a pay rise which is fair in terms of inflation. So I think 19% is nigh out of the question because we have worked so incredibly hard throughout mm. the pandemic and we have proved ourselves time and time again. But we just want something that we can live on that's in line with inflation. We're not asking for millions. We're just asking for a fair, a fair wage. What does it do to you when you feel underpaid, undervalued, overworked, understaffed, under huge pressure. Yeah. What, is, what toll does that take on you as a, a human being? Incredible toll, because all we really want to do is give wonderful care to the patients that we're looking after. That's what we're in the profession to do. That's why we're nurses. We want to look after people. We want to make them better. And when you have all these external things coming in and, and interfering with that, it's demoralising. It's so tough. And I, I quit my job a year or two ago because of all those things pressures that I had on me. I felt I couldn't do it anymore here in the UK and I needed a break. And um, that's what's happening to many, many nurses. And what made you come back? Well, I have a life here in London, so I took a break and I went abroad for a year. I went home to New Zealand, spent lots of time with my family, but I have a life here. Um, and, um, you so know... Now you work in various hospitals well, yeah, yeah, as yeah, an ICU nurse. In intensive care, um, but I don't have a permanent job. Mm. I pick up work day to day, so I have control over when I want to work. Do you feel any qualms about striking? First-time nurses have gone on strike. Obviously, you deal with people's lives. Yeah. Do you feel qualms about doing this on the morality side of it? I mean, we haven't gone into this with no thought. Um, and um, the strike days um, were planned and a lot of thought went into how we were going to strike. We, um, in the hospitals, we still had intensive care, staffed, emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of thought went into how we were going to do it. Um, and I think, but I think it was necessary. We need people to take note. Well, I think the NHS is creaking at the seams and the only people propping it up are people like you. And I thank you for your service. I think it's amazing the job that you do. Thank you. And you were brought into the public attention by what happened with Boris Johnson, but actually you do that every day when you're in the hospital, in the ICU units, saving all sorts of people, most of whom are not leaders of, uh, of country. So thank you and I hope that you get the pay rise you deserve. I want to bring in now another nurse. We're going to call her Anna. She wants to remain anonymous. We're going to say where she... Uh, is a nurse, but she's an experienced NHS nurse who has reservations about these strikes, doesn't feel comfortable. So we're going to call you Anna. Anna, tell me why you don't agree with this, with the strikes. Um, hi, sir. Um, well, me, I don't agree with the strike as such. I mean, everybody can go on strike, right, and demand whatever they want. Uh, but I think the demand is for the fair pay. What exactly is fair? How are we going to define fair? And every time the inflation will change, and are we going to go on strike every time? That's endless. Uh, and I think instead of striking against, I mean, about our pay, we should ask to stop the waste of money in NHS, and then we would have the money for all the uh, pay rise and for everything else we need. 
this is where I think uh, we should be focusing on. Not yeah, I mean, I do think, you know, if I was a nurse right now, I'd be looking at all the money that was squandered on PPE that didn't work, uh, testing systems that didn't work, you know, contracts to companies left, right and centre, all of whom made f fortunes out of stuff that just didn't work in the pandemic. And I'd be thinking, well, we found the money for all that suddenly when we had to. Where is that money actually for the people who are in the coal phase every day? Well, exactly. And, and also, what is the accountability of the wastage of the money? Who order certain things? And, and before pandemic, what about wastage of medication? How many times patient is prescribed medication and given a full dose for, uh, for a certain amount of time and actually stopped in the middle? And the medication is being wasted. It doesn't go anywhere. And, and thousands of thousands of pounds is being just thrown away. What about uh, other things? I don't know, sticker, posters. Other, when, when you're walking on the world, you can see thousands of pounds being just flashed yeah, down the no, toilet. I, I, it must be, you know, it must be it's, it's I also, frustrating. I tell you, I tell you I know what I also feel something. strongly about. I, I absolutely despise the fact that nurses in this country and doctors still have to pay for parking outside hospitals. I think it's a complete <laughs> yes. and utter disgrace that you go in to save people's lives and we charge you for the honour of parking outside the hospitals. It is a total, total disgrace that shames this country. Uh, I've got to leave it there. Anna, thank you for calling in. Uh, keep up the great Thanks. work. I know that you, know, you all basically, I think, share the concerns. It's really about how you get to where you want to get to, which is to be valued properly. So I thank yes. you for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you again, Jenny. I appreciate it. Well, coming next, uh, Donald Trump promised a major announcement today. It's proved to be a major or well, weird disappointment. We'll find out why with tonight's pack that's coming up.
Welcome back. I'm glad to be joined by tonight's pack, Richard Tyson, Isabel Oakshaw. Always has a little bit of spice to the pack, you two. Um, nurses strike. You said a very interesting thing in the break, which I didn't know, that the nurses got a 30% pay rise back in the early 70s. So in the early 70s, actually, there was significant industrial action everywhere. And the yeah. nurses were, uh, they were striking, they were marching all over London. So, you know, there is a track record of industrial action. But look, the reality is the government have handled this appallingly since the end well, of the first lockdown. What it, I put forward, what they should do, because there's a, there's a staffing crisis in healthcare, in social care, yeah. they should say for three years, no, in, no basic rate income tax for any healthcare workers on the front line, including ambulance workers, and you pay for it, about six billion quid, by not paying, uh, the Bank of England shouldn't pay paying interest to the city banks that are already very wealthy. They, they don't need it. Other central banks are not doing that. That would pay for it. That's how you attract and retain and, and get people... I and mean, the other way you could healthcare. do it, Isabel, you could, I've always thought there's an argument to have an extra tax of a penny for everybody, specifically for the NHS and social care. I mean, that's been done before, mm. hasn't it? Um, look, I'm not of the view, actually, that the NHS needs more money, per se. It needs to be better spent. I'm a view of the view that the money that's in it needs to be better spent. Well, you spent. both tweeted about this, this extraordinary story, the NHS Foundation in the Midlands in Stafford, advertising for a £115,000 a year job as a director of lived experience. I mean, what even is what that? What does that mean? Well, I, I This actually... is like Meghan Markle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Huh? I mean... It's not true, but I've lived... I've got a lived experience, so I'm going to just spout on about it. But, but, but the truth is, you wouldn't qualify for that job, actually, because you have to be a strategically talented bridge builder. <laughs> and I'm not sure the bridge builder is you. <laughs> but it is, but this is the trouble is, you read that, you think, well, that's where all the money's yes. going. Well, well, completely. Look, I found that job advert quite easily by looking on websites for NHS jobs that pay over six-figure salaries. Mm. And that's the first thing I alighted upon. And I don't know what it is. And I put it to the employment minister and he had no idea what it was no. either. So, look, I think that we could free up an awful lot of money by cutting jobs that are completely meaningless and a load of the diversity and inclusion, that's low-hanging fruit. There's tons of other stuff. <laughs> Divert that money. What would you give the nurses? The it's really difficult to put a figure on it, but I think it has to be substantial. I really do. And the problem is, with 10% inflation, substantial means you've got to start at 10%. Otherwise, you're basically giving them nothing. I don't have a problem you, with that. Because but what we, about all the, the other all the other people who want their money? You can't give what, them all even you, inflation, you, you, I don't think, right? You can't keep inflating this you know, out of existence. You've got to reduce taxes. You've, you've got to lift it up from the bottom up. That's the way you put more money, more money into people's net pay packets. Is That's it true that right thanks to it. incompetent government, notably by Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting, we simply don't have the money to do what we'd like to do with institutions well, like Well, there's, there's many, many reasons we don't have the money, one of, of which is the not the pandemic, but the response to the pandemic and the billions that were squandered on ridiculous things. You mean by, by that health secretary, Matt Hancock, you mean? Well, I, I certainly mean that there's some of the contracts that one were awarded... One whose book you've just written. Well, as you know, I didn't write which that book out of... Which you managed to blame absolutely everybody, I noticed, apart from... Matt Hancock. Yeah, surprising that, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? I mean, after all, it was his book, so he probably wasn't going to blame himself for anything. <laughs> the waste of money is obscene everywhere. But the reality is, in terms of health spending per capita, we are bang on the OECD average. So we're not underspending on health care. Mm. The truth is, we're spending it badly. I've always thought the there are way too ma many middle management. Yes. I would let the nurses run the wards. I'd go back to the old school matrons, right? You're in charge of the money and you're in charge of the patient care. Get on with it. Because they know how to spend the money better than some manager sitting in a suit in a corner. Well, there are also very good models. In America, the Cleveland, Ohio, has the doctors running everything. Right. Um, so you actually don't have managers that don't understand health care. Maybe that's... we need a superhero to run the NHS, like <laughs> Donald Trump, who, of course, his, his new uh, attempt to get in the back of the White House is falling down in flames, according to polls. So he's now unleashed his new NFT range of himself as a superhero <laughs> in eight different guises. About the 45,000 of these, and you can you can get your own Trump superhero NFT. I'm surprised Making you the haven't planet done it great yet. again. Where are your ones? Well, he's given me an idea, actually. <laughs> exactly. Uh, is, Trump, is Trump done? Yeah, I think he's done. I think he loses, uh, assuming he runs, he loses in the primaries to Ron DeSantis. Yeah. No question at all. I think America wants something different. And I, and I think, think if Biden DeSantis runs again, that, DeSantis wins quite easily. Easily, hands yeah. down. You agree? I, I do, actually. I think he looks tired. I think he looks like yesterday's man. And mm. I think it's an impossible mountain to climb. Yeah. Also, America, I think, has just had enough uh, yeah. of two old guys. They've just yeah. seen it, done it, want to move on. Thank you, Pat.
Uh, whatever you're up to tonight, keep it uncensored. That's it for tonight. Good night.